I just called the meeting to order. So okay. We're, we're ordered now. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, um, uh, the first issue is public comment, and I don't know that we have any public comment. Uh, this, the next item would be a presentation on the Fairwater Ferry Pilot Service to Dunedin. Yeah. Okay. And that, that these are the people giving me. Hi. Yes. Hi. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't have the names on. I'd like to introduce the Rodriguez's, the owners of the Fairwater Ferry. They're going to make this presentation. presentation. Hi, I'm Trisha Rodriguez. My husband Dennis is right there. We own the ferry. Okay. I just have a couple of slides. I think you have a copy. Of, I, I think you have um, this is going to be very brief. We've just been asked to come and give you kind of a brief outline of what our new pilot program is going to be to Dunedin. Um, to give you guys an idea. Oh, thank you. To give you an idea of what um, we already do. Um, I think all of you know um, for Clearwater, it's just basically downtown Clearwater to Clearwater Beach. We do have three stops on Clearwater Beach. Um, and then one stop, or three stops total, one um, being at the uh, Clearwater Beach Marina, the other being at the rec center near the, um, near the, well, at the end of the street by the Clearwater Beach Rec Center, and then we also go to Island Estates. So this is in addition to that. Um, that is not a pilot program, that's a set program in Clearwater. This is a pilot program that will begin in Dunedin. Um, and we are anticipating this to begin in um, October. Check the sides. Sometimes it's all oh. the, the red or green. Oh, it's off. Sorry. No problem. There you go. So these are our uh, pilot program timeline of we where we anticipate to go, um, when our departure times. Uh, we are beginning it just for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We have the ability to, at any point that we see the ridership is increasing, we can add more days, but we'll do that on our own, and then we'll, of course, announce that. But this is scheduled to begin on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays only. And uh, you'll see that we do depart from, there's departures from Clearwater Beach, as well as downtown Clearwater and Dunedin. The route will be from, the boats will actually go from downtown, I mean, sorry, from the beach to downtown to Dunedin, and then back to the beach. So if you're coming directly, if you're coming from downtown, you, if you're coming from downtown, you can go right to Dunedin. If you're coming to, if you're already at the beach, you can uh, get on the boat in, at the beach, stop in downtown, and then it'll go to Dunedin. But then if you're leaving Dunedin, you can go right to the beach. So we're doing it that way. Um, so the departures begin um, from Clearwater Beach at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And then the last departure from Dunedin is at 10.25 p.m. Um, some people might say, well, what if we're having dinner and we will be later than 10.25? Then um, you're welcome to take the jolly trolley. <laughs> you're welcome to take other modes of transportation. Um, and we'll have all that information. We're really going to work closely with the jolly trolley and their routes and their times so that all the communication is clear and so people always know the other modes of transportation that they can take. Um, we are limited in this pilot program to passenger load because we are starting out with our smallest boat, which is a 21 passenger. Um, and then we will, we can always use our 42 passenger, but that is pretty much the maximum at, in the pilot program because we're not going to invest in another boat. Um, we don't have any public funding or anything like that. It's just us as a company that are doing this and trying this program. So if we, for example, are overloaded, then they'll have to find other modes of transportation to get back, to get there, whatever. We're going to make sure all of that is available. And then um, the pricing is a little bit different for Dunedin because it does take a little bit longer to get there. So um, our red line pricing, this is the current pricing for our red line and our purple line, which again are our existing lines that I just talked about. And that's $4 for adults, $3 for seniors, $2 for uh, children. And then those, of course, connect them from downtown Clearwater to the beach, Island of States and North Beach, as I said. And then the blue line, which this is the start of the blue line. This is the anchor that will become the blue line eventually. And that will be the cost of $8. Right now we only go to Dunedin, but it'll be $8 eventually. And then um, Dunedin residents do get a little bit of a discount of $6. As seniors are $6, children are $3, and three and under are free. This is my business card information if you'd like to reach me. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. That's one way, each $8 each Correct. Way. 
Correct. There, is there going to be a daily pass kind of thing where people yes. would go? And yes. We'll have just like as the pilot program develops, we'll have just like we have in Clearwater, which will have a monthly pass, a day. We probably won't do day passes because we feel like, well, we might. If, 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 it, if the ridership warrants it and wants it, but we tried to do that in Clearwater, it didn't really work. Mm -hmm. Um, because people would just take it and ride it around and then it used up our ridership because, because somebody was just on the boat and they just used it kind of as a tour boat. We've got to make sure that we leave the, you know, the space open for people yeah, to actually get from one place to the other. Like a round trip um, pass. But yeah, round trip passes, um, monthly passes, annual passes, all of that. Any other questions? Is this every day? Every day. I mean, well, every, through, I mean, Friday through Sunday, oh. um, October through, um, we're leaving it open. We're hoping this grows into, we're saying it's a six month pilot program that isn't defined yet um, because we're waiting for the city of Dunedin to really define it for us. We're leaving it open um, because what we're hoping this pilot program, we're anticipating good ridership, which would just bring us into a regular contractual agreement with the city of Dunedin. They'd have to put an RFP and that whole process would begin. This question is obvious to everybody else, but are you going to take a boat to Dunedin? Yeah. How? How? Where? How? Okay. Um, I should have included a map. Okay. So are you familiar with the intercoastal waterways of Pinellas, of Clearwater, where Clearwater is? Do you yes. Are you familiar with downtown yes. Clearwater? So right there, right under the bridge, you know where the bridge is from Clearwater to downtown Clearwater? Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. We go right under that bridge and just keep going across the intercoastal water about 20 minutes, and then Dunedin is right there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've driven by that spot many times. Where in Dunedin? Okay. Um, at the marina, that right pier. there by Bon Appetit. Is that the pier? It is, the it's pier? not a pier per se, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah. downtown Dunedin, right by, um, what's it called, the restaurant? Old, Old, Old Bay Cafe. And uh, Bon Appetit. I think it's exciting. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I took the, uh, the ferry a couple weeks back okay. uh, to from Clearwater out to Clearwater Beach and very much enjoyed it and found it, you know, very, and it was also very handicapped accessible too, okay. which was very good. Too. Thank you. Thank you for an opportunity to present to you. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon. I, I want to thank uh, Trish and her husband for coming and giving this presentation. I thought it would be great. I don't know how many of you uh, have gotten an opportunity to ride the Clearwater Ferry, uh, but I think this is this is definitely something that the whole region is looking at and ways that we might expand this option because, you know, especially when the traffic is really bad, uh, it's not so bad on the water. Um, it's, a, it's a really good option to get to and from the uh, Clearwater Beach, and then I, you know, hopefully this thing will be very successful to go up to Dunedin yeah. as well. Uh, so thank you, thank you guys very much. And we, and we're at PSTA, we're trying to work closer uh, with uh, uh, the Clearwater Ferry to try to integrate the services. And so you know, as she said, like at some points maybe you might take the jolly trolley one way and take the ferry the other way, or um, or another PSTA service. Try to try to integrate it all and make it easier for people to use. Is that great? Well, thank, you. Great. thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, uh, the next item on our agenda is my chair report, and the first thing I wanted to do was introduce us to two new members of the committee. Um, we have Louis Romero, who is now the new alternate for North County. Uh, he's from Carpenter Springs. Nice to meet everybody. It's a pleasure to serve uh -huh. and an honor as well. Thank you. Thank you. And then Kevin Lay, is it? Lai. Lai, um, who is now our alternate student from St. Petersburg. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in fact, if, if we can do this real quickly, we can go around the room and just everybody introduce themselves uh, just so that, so that our new members know who we all are. Why don't you start with Mark? Uh, I'm Mark O'Hara. I represent South County. Kim Rankin, I represent Dark Dominion Response Transportation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Cassandra Borchers. I'm the Chief Development Officer here at PSTA. I'm Gloria Lepic Corrigan. I'm the, uh, also North County and uh, the Chair of the Committee this year. 
I'm Brad Miller, the CEO of PSPA, and thanks for coming, our new members. I'm John Estlock. I'm the new student rep. I live in uh, Safety Harbor, and I used to be the alternate for the judge county. Uh, I'm David Schneider. I'm the alternate professional. Whatever that means. I'm Dave Comer. I'm the north rep. I live in Safety Harbor. Tracy Dunphy, I'm the representative for the beaches. Elizabeth Olden and Miss Nellis. Richard McDaniel, South County Rep, and I live in St. Petersburg. Thank you. And yes, welcome to welcome to our committee. Um, okay. Now, uh, in addition, on our on my chair report, just uh, to update you on what occurred at the last board meeting, which was after our last track meeting. Um, just some of the, the interesting points that I went back and re-looked at what it was covered in that meeting. And uh, at our meet last meeting, we talked about the vision and mission statements that um, Mr. Miller showed us then. Uh, the board looked at those and they approved those. Interestingly, one thing that, I, uh, that ended up happening was that uh, the word safety was added into the uh, mission statement and I, when I went back and I looked at that, and we're, we're talking about one of our initiatives being about safety. And I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? It, 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 yeah, and the person that originally had asked for it was really talking about the safety that's involved with PSTA. I think a lot of us feel very strongly that, that PSTA is very de dedicated towards safety and our safety as riders. But, um, you know, we're, we're talking about safety in, in a whole lot of different contexts. So I thought that was, that was very interesting. Um, and then uh, Henry Lukasik showed us about the small bus purchase that they're working on, which again, I think that affects a lot of us in the, in, you know, the whole with connector buses and so forth. So that was a very interesting uh, discussion and that was approved. That. And then uh, Chris Cochran talked about the, the Sandbox grant program. And again, the Sandbox is something that those of us with disabilities care very much about, I think, in terms of how, when that gets rolled out, how we can have on-demand, uh, more on-demand service as well. Uh, was there anything else from the board meeting that you can recall that was? Uh, well, as um, the chair mentioned, we did have a robust discussion about the mission and vision statement uh, mm -hmm. before approving it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, this didn't happen at the board meeting, but we had a very successful uh, uh, transit town hall uh, just on Friday, uh, this past Friday, down at Grand Central. And for those of you who have been, have been to one, uh, we try to have about every every month or every six weeks or so have a transit center town hall where uh, not only myself but a number of PSPA uh, planners and and other staff attend, and we advertise it on the buses, and then we usually get really good attendance of people that come that specifically uh, take the bus directly to come talk at the Transit Center Town Hall. Of course, then other people, we always have them at a Transit Center, like in Clearwater or Countryside Mall or Tyrone Mall, and, um, and, and talk to writers who are just happy to be there as well. And we get a lot of really good ideas from that. So um, if you see one that's somewhere near where you live uh, sometime soon, stop by. And we'll give you a name tag, or Mary Ann will, and you can answer the questions too. <laughs> Or get yelled at like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or just listen. Which is what we're really <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All righty. Well, thank you. Thank you for that update. Um, okay, uh, the first action item that we have, oh no, I'm sorry, then, then comes the forward Pinellas report, but you said that there was really, uh, uh, wasn't CAC, there wasn't anything to, uh, to report at this point um, from the Citizens Advisory Committee. We will talk about that in terms of nominating a, a member for that. Um, okay, the first action item we have then is we need to uh, nominate a vice chair uh, for the committee. As, as I think some of you know, Carson has accepted a position in Tallahassee uh, with, yeah, with the Department of Environment. Environmental um, and so he has left our committee, he's left our county. And we need to uh, nominate a new vice chair for the committee. And um, again, the procedure, you have a ballot there. 
how, how, I'm trying to remember how we did this, that we, yes. we asked for nominees first and then everyone has a chance to vote for. Um, yes, I'm handing out all eligible members, but you could, you could call for nominations and then we vote for them. Okay, yeah. Um, do we want to look at the listing first? Just pass those okay. Yeah, pass that out first. So, um, David, this is why we have alternates. David will now be the full-on professional representative. Um, and so, so many of you may ask, why do we have alternates? It's because we want some continuity in the voting membership of the, um, uh, of the committee. If you are an alternate and um, the main representative is present, then you are not able to vote. If they are not present, then, then you are eligible to vote. So um, in this case, uh, okay. Kevin is the student. The student is here. It's John. Um, in the case of Lewis, I think that we have Gloria from North County. Who else is from North County? Ditko. Okay. So that's so both North County um, uh, members are here. So um, what Marianne is passing out is um, a list of eligible members. Um, in the bylaws, it does say you have to be a member for a certain amount of time before being an officer, and I think that's just to get everybody familiar with what's happening. So these are a list of um, eligible members. Um, from this list, um, you can make nominations, and then we can um, vote from there. So you, not everybody has to be on the list, only those that are nominated and accept a nomination. So with that, I think, we're ready to open the floor, if you're ready to open the floor um, for questions. Yeah, um, oh, one, just one other thing I wanted to say real quickly about the, about the um, alternate, uh, or the vice chair, is that, you know, what I, I know I did not realize that, that what had become the, the practice is that the chair comes to this meeting, but then also attends the board meeting the following Wednesday and gives a report on what was covered at the track. Um, I know that, in my case, I will be out in August, so whoever would take this would, uh, you know, hopefully be able to chair the meeting in, the, in August, but also then be available the following Wednesday to go to the board to give the presentation. That's not that that doesn't that isn't a make or break it, but I, I wanted to let you all know that that's part of what's involved in that too. Uh, so, um, Richard, you were raising your hand. Were you yes, I, I um, on this first bullet point here. Um, Mr. Zimmer's term expired at the end of 2018, but his vice chair position expires at the end of this year. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, does, would, are there, do I hear any nominees? Yeah, uh, Mark O'Hara. <laughs> <laughs> any other nominees? You have to accept the nominees. Oh, I accepted, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Any other nominees? I, I do have another question. Can people nominate themselves? Absolutely. People can nominate themselves. Any other nominees? Okay, well, I think this is going to be pretty easy. This is going to be pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> we have one nominee, and uh, you, you can either vote for him or not vote for him. <laughs> so.
If not, um, could I hear a motion to approve the minutes? Approved. Okay, thank you. Elizabeth's making the motion to second. approve. Richard, second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The minutes are approved. The next item now is an amendment to our bylaws to uh, basically, is that, is that to allow for this, the mm -hmm. CAC? For, um, as I think all of you remember, the uh, Forward Pinellas Citizens Advisor, Advisory Committee, our citizen, yeah, Citizens Advisory Committee, um, has approved us to have a member from TRAC on that committee. And so uh, we need to amend our bylaws to allow for, how, how does that, I'm not exactly sure how that is phrased. Um, we're asking for an amendment to your bylaws so that um, we know how that member is chosen and what the responsibilities of that member are, uh, that member is. Um, the, the, um, some of the, specific duties are spelled out in the CAC membership in terms of they have their own term limits and their own attendance, but um, our uh, recommendation here is that um, you all um, nominate someone every year so that um, you comply with our term limits and not the term limits of the um, MPO, which are shorter. So in theory, you could be a track representative on the CAC a lot longer um, than their regular term limits. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. In theory. Okay. So how how do we need to phrase this then, Cassandra, so that it's um, Well, you could just um, the the paragraph that is new is the fifth paragraph under Article Three membership. Um, so this is. Um, that the track representative serving on the CAC shall be approved by the majority voting members of the track, and then shall report to the track at monthly meetings and represent the track in its goal of improving PSTA service and safety to all riders in Pinellas County. The track shall appoint or confirm the representative to the CAC annually or as needed, meaning that if there's a vacancy, um, and then the appointee shall comply with other requirements such as attendance as prescribed in the CAC bylaws. Um, the recommendation that this committee makes today will go um, to the PSTA board and then to the Ford Pinellas board. Um, so basically at this point what, what I, I would be wanting would be a, a, um, a motion from the committee to approve this wording approve this change, change to our change to our bylaws. I make a motion to um, change the bylaws. Sorry if I as, missed that. As listed here. In as the, listed here, correct. Under Article Three membership. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Can I have a second, please? Second. Theresa, second. Uh, all in favor? Uh, aye, aye, aye. aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Now the next is to actually appoint a representative from track to the CAC. And I'm not sure what kind of um, be the same as you did just mm -hmm. before. In according to these guidelines here, or, or I mean in terms of a nominee? Yes, in terms of the, so follow these. So you have to be approved by a majority of the voting members. Mm -hmm. Um, I would call for nominations and then vote as we just did the, the vice chair. The one question I have is CAC requires that a member of, that for a person to be on the CAC, they have to attend at least one meeting before they can be appointed to that position. Well, that's their, that's their selection criteria. Mm -hmm. So our so, selection criteria are different because so we can actually nominate yes. someone who has not. In theory, yes. 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 Okay. Um, the the one person that uh, you know, John is already on. John Estock is already on the CAC. Um, then 
the other, uh, Dave Kovars did attend a CAC meeting. I've attended a CAC meeting, but I, I really would prefer that I would not be the representative, but rather. Um, and so if anyone else is interested, though, um, I would say, again, we could either nominate someone or have them nominate themselves, correct? Mm -hmm. And even if you decide three months from now that you're interested in the CAC, if there's a, an opening, you can um, apply to be a member independently of the track. Mm -hmm. It doesn't... That's correct. Doesn't, That's this, right. This doesn't preclude you from applying to be just a regular selected member. Mm -hmm. We can have all of y'all be on. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, but the catch with the CAC, by the way, is that is a meeting that is held at night. It's, it's once a month, but it's, it's uh, the following week after our track meeting. Uh, but it runs from 7 to 9, is that correct? I think, yeah, 7 to 9 yeah, p.m. Uh, down in Clearwater. Clearwater. This so, month it's on Thursday. Is it's it? the fourth. Thursday. Is it always on a Thursday? Yeah. Okay. This is a good So um, I, at this point, I would uh, be interested in, in anyone being nominated or nominating yourself. Richard. I nominate David Kovar. Okay. okay. David, if I can you say the, well, the problem that I'm having right now is that I'm scheduling a trip uh, that may coincide and end up missing the very first meeting, which would July. I would make June, but would end up missing either July or July and August. Oh. There is no July thing. Yeah. Oh, there is no? I accept. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any other uh, nominees for the position? Then do we need to actually pass out the, the, the voting thing, or can we do it by voice vote? There is, yeah, it, whatever you like. It just says, it, it just says a majority. Majority. Mm. I, 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 I think I'd like to um, entertain a motion to nominate uh, Dave Kovars as our representative to CAC. Um, so moved. I second it. So moved. Okay. And Kim seconded. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And you are opposed? Carries. Congratulations, Dave. Yeah. And the promotion. <laughs> then the next item we're going to flip on the agenda. We're going to do the lease agreement with the St. Pete Police Department. This is uh, Theo. Did I get? Let me get it right. Theo. Theo Bakamihalis. Very good. Yes. Wow. Very nice. From uh, our safety. A security and training team. Yeah, good afternoon, folks. Thank you for being here. Um, Being here, folks. Well, my name is Theo Bakomialis. I'm a lead supervisor with Safety, Security, and Training. Um, the reason I'm here today is to discuss with you a um, <clears throat> not an action item, no cost agreement that we have between St. Petersburg Police Department and uh, PSTA concerning the sharing of some space at our Grand Central Station and the creation of a police resource center on property. Uh, Grand Central Station, as you know, is a very vibrant, very busy uh, terminal of ours. 
situated in uh, St. Petersburg. You have First Avenue South here on the bottom, Central on top, and US 19 is just about a block to the left here. <coughs> Um, throughout our discussions with St. Petersburg Police Department, it was deemed that it would be mutual beneficial if uh, there was a police presence on uh, making a police recreation center, uh, resource center, it would be inside the building. We also have a um, parking space that has already been created for them so they'd have their own parking space. And it would uh, facilitate St. Petersburg Police Department in uh, servicing the public and the community of St. Pete along with uh, our needs as well. Um, yeah, same, uh, but it, here, um, when you look here, just some slides. We have uh, this would be our front window. We have two of these windows where our customer service representatives um, deal with the public. Uh, basically, on a busy day, you do have lineups of people waiting here. They sell cards, give out information, and all of the above from the inside. This is the room that we are um, going to be using, where St. Petersburg Police Department will have access to. And if we pull back the view a little bit, there's the window. And you're looking about the center of the, uh, of the interior. Okay. Um, that's from another angle. Again, that's the room that they'll be using. Um, St. Peter, uh, Grand Central Station, if you know, the buses do enter, they circle around the station. They park along the curb all the way around. It is a busy, busy terminal. Um, people roaming around, going all which ways. In the background, you can see the buses actually drive around the park buses. <clears throat> so again, basically what we're looking for is uh, just uh, an agreement, the, um, uh, how do you call it? The uh, uh, agreement of a, a non-action lease agreement where they would be using up our, um, our space inside and uh, promoting safety and security within the terminal. And that's about it. Any questions? Is there any reason why we wouldn't think this was a good idea? I don't go there, but it's... Uh, I can't see any negativity in it whatsoever, no. Yes. Um, do we have any idea how it says that we're going to be, uh, or PSTA is going to be providing electricity and several other um, water, gas, sewer, et cetera, and then maintenance, maintenance as well? Uh, exterior yes, it's paint, in the terms. Exterior paint. Do we have any um, idea how much that's going to cost? It shouldn't really cost us anything more. The police department is bringing in their own furnishings, their desk, their computer. They're using their internet, their Wi-Fi, uh, their phone line, their phones. Uh, basically, our lights are on. Our air conditioning is on. Um, I don't, you know, that room is lit most of the time anyway, so I don't see it really costing anything more than, you know, than flushing our toilets maybe a few extra times. <laughs> I, I was thinking of uh, the gear electronics that the police officers use and charging yeah, they're bringing them all there of their own. Well. It's going to be all of their equipment. Yeah, I was, but the, the, the cost to charge those. <clears throat> the electricity, we, I haven't calculated specifically what it would cost. Uh, whatever that's going to be uh, would be minimal compared to the uh, benefits that we're going to be having from it. So uh, with time, I guess we can start looking at that if, if it is an issue. But the benefits rendered, um, there is no cost in this agreement, and so we will be benefiting security and safety at, at no cost to us except for the electricity, I guess, that they're going to be using. Yes? Um, there, there's a problem with the structure. So it doesn't have to do with the agreement with the police, but are you the person to talk to about the safety problem at the Grand Central Station? Well, you can talk to us maybe afterwards or, okay, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, you can talk to us and uh, my superintendent sitting okay. in the back there, Mike. Don't let me go home until I talk to you. All right, <laughs> sounds good. Yep. Anything else related? Do we have a similar agreement with any of the other stations or uh, downtown? Or no, that? not at this time. We do have um, a security company that we are uh, contracted and so we have security at our other stations so this is a new idea this is a uh, beginning of something cool. yes which uh, because you're talking with the police department has arrest powers are armed our security company at this point is unarmed with no arrest powers okay. yeah will this replace a security company that's already no it's going to be for now we're looking at it as in addition to an amelioration a betterment okay. um, and they'll, they'll be working side by side 
What is this now? This space. Used what is what? For? What's what's, what's the space used for now? It basically was just some cabinets, and we were just keeping some stocks, some schedules in there, which we found space for right away. I mean, it was nothing. And there was no uh, no work being conducted in there. So we didn't lose any space. Sounds like win-win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We hope so. That's what we're looking for. Yeah. And uh, St. Petersburg is actually very eager to, to begin as well. The terms of the agreement would be yearly. Uh, with the uh, ability to extend, and we would be starting first of August, which is coming up, and um, basically that would that would be it. It's it's uh, not much more complex than that. So, so this is an action item, so we are seeking approval. Approval from the item, board yes. for recommendation to the board. So I uh, would hear a. Motion, thank you. Motion. Thank you. Okay. Approve this motion. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then our next item is to address the safety initiative letter. Um, we had a meeting of a, a, a group of members uh, for to address the first initiative letter that we had, we had talked about relative to safety and put together a preliminary letter that um, we could approve as is or we could make adjustments to it as, as needed. Uh, we would like to be able to present this to the board. Uh, next week. Uh, have you all had a chance to look through the uh, draft initiative letter? Oh, okay. All right. We can use it in this format. Okay. Um, this is blocked. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just to step back, too, on, when, on these initiatives, what I know that we had talked about the idea of we want to be able to present to the board the perspectives of riders so that they have a sense of what we as riders are seeing as you know as different than what just citizens of the county see in terms of public transportation and uh, safety became an issue as we talked about that we always talk about safety relative to our buses and our, our bus stops but what we talked about in this letter is the fact that in our committee we said it's end-to-end -end safety for us. When we make the decision to ride a bus, we make the decision to leave our homes not in a private vehicle, but rather on the sidewalks and, and, and to the bus stops. And then, again, when we get off the buses, we count on there being safe sidewalks and safe ways to get to our destinations. Um, and so that was the structure of the, the note that we had put together. Um, again, I come back. Have you read through this? Did you have questions and thoughts about it? Careful again. Um, when it says, uh, when we choose to travel using public transportation over a private, instead of a private car, safety on the bus is just a part of the equation. And then you talk about, like you just said, start to finish. Uh, there's a whole list of things. The buses are safe, sidewalks are fairly contiguous and safe, although can present challenges. But then the next part, bus stop safety is consistent with the sidewalks and roadways. Wait, but we just said some can present a challenge. So is sometimes inconsistent with the sidewalks? Or am I not picturing it right? Okay, well, I, what I was thinking was, was consistent with, you know, some, some sidewalks are not, you know, some neighborhoods, the, the sidewalks are not as good. Like I know, for example, Safety Harbor as an example. Right. The sidewalks are not great. Um, and so the safety of the sidewalks there are pretty much consistent with those roadways. Um, whereas in certain other communities where they have actually put in new, new sidewalks and roadways, that, that's where I've... Those but if it's confusing, confusing, if it's confusing to you as a committee member, mm -hmm. then it may be confusing to the board as well. Mm -hmm. um, are there, is there a better way that we can phrase that? Mm 
Well, I'm trying to make all the mood match through all the all the points. Mm -hmm. uh, buses are quite safe. Sidewalks are fairly contiguous, although some can present challenges. Bus stop safety is consistent with sidewalks. Well, that's a good thing. Where they are located, for example, you were just saying sometimes neighborhoods are not as safe as other neighborhoods. Right. They're that's like they're fairly contiguous and safe. They're not. They're not perfectly safe and right. contiguous. I think what has been our bus experience. Stop safety is fairly consistent. If it's going to be fairly contiguous, it's fairly consistent. Are you saying? Are you trying to say that bus stop safety is only yes. as um, safe as the sidewalks and roadways where they're located? That's are correct. Safe? I like that. That's right. Yeah. Right. That was the intent, I think, what you had. Oh, but I like the way you this, said this it. Is a list, this is a list that's outlining that it's not just riding the bus. You have to view safety is all part of the sidewalks, the roads, yeah. the stores, and the businesses access. The whole trip. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. should we so should we modify the way that it's phrased? I mean, you, it, I like what he said, but it's recorded. So bus so bus stop safety is only as safe as the sidewalks and roadways where they are located. <clears throat> yeah. I don't see it's yes. only as. Any other thoughts and comments on this? Yes, Rick. I, I really like this idea of creating a directory uh, for the danger zones. And I know that um, Florida Consumer Action Network is working with the city of St. Pete on the Complete Streets program. Mm -hmm. And it seems like they um, have been doing some research on this. And so they might be able to help us identifying some of uh, danger zones. And as, I'll be looking out for them as well and keeping track of them. And, and letting y'all know if we if we do proceed with this, creating a uh, directory. I guess I envisioned, and and tell me if I'm incorrect in this, that that when we present this to the board, that that's some of the feedback that I would want to see from the, the board too, is to say, you know, riders of our of our transit system, that's a that's a good idea. Why don't you work with these agencies that we may not be aware of? You obviously were aware of that one. I was not aware of that. And, and maybe there is a way that we can work in conjunction with some of the, the other agencies that are doing the work of, of getting the information. Well, I, uh, that's exactly right. I know, and I know about the St. Petersburg um, Complete Street uh, Initiative, and then the Ford Pinellas MPO is working hard on as well as you know, a number of uh, MPOs are working around the state on a, a whole safety campaign, I think mostly focused on car accidents, but it's about bicycle and pedestrian safety, and this should feed right into it. Part of their vision zero, they call it. Sure it has zero, I guess zero fatalities is the goal. Yeah. Who is this going to go to? Cities or lawmakers? Well, initially, this is what we wanted to present to the Board of PSTA. Um, but I, I guess, again, what I was envisioning, and tell me if I'm wrong, but is that they that we would get recommendations then on who else we should be presenting this to. Because, you know, I think that this is a very, this is the unique perspective of those of us who are riding our buses every day. And, and are experiencing the things that are safe and unsafe and, and, and the choices we have to make. Um, no other group has the same view that we all do. So for, for an initial letter, you know, I would recommend that we send it to uh, Forward Pinellas, asking them to send it to their planning advisory committee, which has mem uh, planning staff from all of the cities so that sort of instead of sending it out to individual cities, you can have it sent to that committee and ask them to take it back to their cities. Um, and also the technical coordinating committee, which has is is there are other transportation folks, there are land use folks, 
attend the PAC committee and then the transportation folks um, on the technical coordinating committee. So both of those are under Forward Pinellas. Um, sending it to FCAN, the Florida Consumer Action Network, I think would be really good because they are working with the city of St. Petersburg as well as the Florida Department of Transportation um, government liaison um, who's also in charge of some of the bike ped coordinators so that uh, Stephen Benson, he can give it to um, the folks at, at District 7. So our next step then, what, what, is the, what is the best way for us to proceed? If you all agree with this letter the way it is with, with a, what other, other modifications might be needed, what should we do next? Um, if, if everyone's happy with the letter as it stands, um, then we would take it to the board, um, tell them where we're going to send it, and um, ask, you know, if you wanted to ask them to approve it, you could. If you wanted to send it, I suppose you could just do that. I don't know if you have to necessarily ask their permission to send this letter. Mm -hmm. <coughs> No need for them to approve that. No, but you could just tell them in your report that, that this is what we are. And here's the letter. Do. Here's the letter, and here's what we're, who we're sending it to. If you have any other, yeah. if you would like us to send it to your staff, <coughs> we'd be more than happy to send it to your staff directly. Okay, sure. Or we we also or some we, other we said we can yeah. even present it to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there are several of us that have said that we would be glad to go to our communities and say, mm -hmm. this is what what riders look like. This is what riders mm -hmm. want. Okay, um, so our next step then is for us to make <coughs> the modifications that what Elizabeth mentioned on that part of the, the uh, sentence. Is there anything else that, that you all saw? Yes. Well, um, on the last part, um, where it started listing like um, danger zones, mm -hmm. I didn't really see anything for St. Pete. Oh, and that's because the, the not, no one from St. Pete gave it. Okay. Yeah, and I would welcome that. Yeah, because it, it, because yeah. the danger zones came from largely from mm -hmm. me and Elizabeth. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, there was two or three other people there. Yeah, mm -hmm. they pitched in. Sure. Yeah, um, it's something to add in something South County St. Pete because oh, I, I can tell there's that. a if, if you up. have if you have anything like that, yeah. we mm -hmm. need to obviously get it in there. But I, you know, I, and what I said on these danger zones was this is just an example. Right. This is not this is not meant. And I guess my other question is, where would we house something like this, this legend of danger zones, and how would it get acted on? I mean, because, you know, there are some of these things that, that we know are, are real dangers, but, but we have no impact to make them. Well, and that's why I think we need to involve uh, Forward Pinellas, um, and they have access to local jurisdictions and they can also be um, the repository for this kind of information both at the county level and um, for different different jurisdictions of roadways so they may they, if you give it to the Florida Department of Transportation they'll just focus on their roads if you give it to the county they'll focus on their roads but the uh, board Pinellas can hang on everything okay this would and and so in a conversation with staff, I would say that this is something that our track is asking them to take up as a potential study, and then they could go ahead and, and add that into their work program. But the the um, so the action today would be the committee um, agreeing to allow the chair to refine and send the letter. Um. And I guess I, I, I'm wondering, do I need to have a, a as an action item, a vote from the committee to uh, that, that I be allowed to make work with PSTA to modify the letter and have it prepared to go to the board at the next board meeting? Could I, I would entertain a motion for us to do that. Uh, I'll make a motion. I'll second. Second. All in favor of doing that? Um, Aye. Opposed? Um, I would also add, if you Question. notice anything else, 
between, you know, in the next day or two from the letter that you think might be worth noting, um, you know, corrections or anything like that, let us know so that we have a, the best possible, uh, like, you know, Mark, something from St. Pete. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be very helpful. I'd like to have any, any other danger zones that you all have spotted around the county, please, you know, we'll include them as, as, as examples so that everyone sees that it is throughout the county. And then route us the final P, you know, PDF of the final letter. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, okay, then the one, the one other item is the, uh, an information item on the draft budget. Uh, who is talking about that? That would be our chief financial officer, Debbie Leas. Oh, there she is. I didn't I, see I, her. I was hiding. Hi, Debbie. <laughs> I think just like what you were going through on the safety items tell a very good story of what you can bring to the table. Numbers also tell a good story. And I've got a very positive one to talk about. And it's turned off. Very positive one to talk about today. Um, some of the positive news in here is that we have no service changes. There's no service cuts in the budget. Our millage rate is remaining the same. Uh, we found ways of mitigating some very potentially high increases in health insurance costs to our employees. We've been able to balance our budget all the way through 2021, providing some fiscal stability. And we've come up with some innovative ways of doing things that will not only save us money, but provide a long-term solution to maintaining our buses. This is done, all these positive things are done despite the fact that we're facing about a $2 million loss in property tax revenue with the homestead exemption that would start in 2020. So let me tell you a little bit about the budget process. We start this in about February, and it's a very long, thoughtful process. We put things together, we take the summertime after we present this uh, draft budget here in June to take an even closer look and update numbers, review things, and make further decisions. And then we take it to public hearings in September. We always start the budget process by looking where we're at today. So we take a look at our forecast for the 2017 budget. And in here we had budgeted an anticipated surplus of around $600,000. As you can see in the second column over, we have a forecast of $163,000 deficit. I have to say the accounting department is taking the blame for that one. You know, despite <coughs> the fact that fares have been down this year, all of our divisions have done a fantastic job in containing expenses. But we've had a change in accounting practice related to the property tax, which has had an uh, impact of about $525,000 negatively. So without that, we would have had a surplus this year. So this becomes our starting point, and we challenge each of the divisions as to what they're proposing, taking a look at how they've done things in the past, and what are they doing differently in the future. At the end of the day, right now on our draft budget, for 2018, we have an anticipated surplus of $848,000. Very good news. When we take a look at some of the highlights that are in here, our, our fair revenues we're anticipating will be flat to what we forecast for this year. We know that property tax is going to be increasing about $3.9 million. Part of that relates to the accounting change in a positive way next year, and the rest of it relates to increases in property values. In addition, we know our DART costs are going up, partially contractual and partially because our ridership is up. Our CARE ride is doing a fantastic job. Yay! <laughs> we have no new staff positions in this budget, but through the efficiencies that we are creating through the help of the planning department and scheduling department, we're able to eliminate six positions, operator positions through attrition. Attrition means when a position becomes vacant, we don't have to fill it. And we're going to see maybe a little bit of increase in overtime, but overall we're going to be saving money through route efficiencies. That leads us to the one thing I didn't mention yet, and that's our fringe benefit rates. 
Fringe benefits are anticipated to go about $1.8 million, mainly because of health insurance. Because of that, I want to spend a little time talking about health insurance costs. We have seen over the last two years, our claims costs have gone up about 75% over two years. It's mainly due to a lot of catastrophic claims. The result is we're anticipating about a 25% increase in our health insurance costs. Now we have an agreement with the union as part of their contract that we share this increase 50-50. Most of our employees are on a single plan. Currently we pay $23.10 each paycheck, that's every two weeks. With the 25% increase, and if we split it 50-50, that basically triples to $70.25. This is going to severely impact our ability to attract and maintain our employee base. So we took a look at where we've been hiring our employees over the last two years. Most of the people we've brought on board are mid-career employees. Why do they apply to PSTA for, for jobs? Because we've got a very good health insurance program. So this is going to have a negative impact here unless we do something differently. So PSTA is willing to pick up a greater share of this. So what we're looking at is we will pick up almost 94% of that increase with the employees paying 6.3%. So we'd be going from $23 a paycheck to only $29 a paycheck. So it's my job as we're going through um, the process here with the health insurance companies that have bid to get this to a point where we can afford it and we will absorb it within our budget and be kind to our employees. So that is how I define success on the health insurance side. We also are going to be, you're going to be hearing a lot about a performance scorecard for PSTA. That is something I don't know if we've talked about it in track in the past, but you'll be hearing about it. And we will be looking at the whole organization and uh, each division will have its own and each department, each individual, a scorecard or performance. And some of the things we've got in the budget is $100,000 to do some surveys. It's a joint procurement with Heart Across the Bay, and we'll be looking at surveys on community support, customer satisfaction, as well as employee engagement. In the capital budget, we've got a rather large capital budget of $22.9 million. One of the things that I'm trying to get to is have what we call financial diversity or better known as other people's money, OPM. So we want to get out there and find other people's money to help us achieve our goals and objectives. In this upcoming budget next year, we've been successful in getting funding for electric bus chargers from Pinellas County. We've been working with the City of Clearwater to split the cost for the Clearwater Beach Transfer Facility. I always have to make sure I say the name right. And we're also getting grant funds through the Community Development Grants for Shelters. And in the very bottom, our hybrid uh, component replacement plan. One of the things that has us concerned with the hybrid buses, while they're very, very environmentally effective, is how are we going to pay for those batteries? So we've come up with a way to do that through the capital program using PSTA dollars that will save us a lot of money. When I send out something through procurement that's federally funded, the attachment for all the rules and regulations is 40 pages. When I don't have to do that, people can sigh with relief at the vendor level, give us lower prices. We tried this with engines and found that we could success successfully save about half a million to three quarters of a million dollars over the next couple of years. So next year we will be getting the eight uh, replacement connector vehicles, which we brought to the board last month. We're getting nine replacement buses, BAE, hybrid electrics, and we will be receiving two electric buses next year. In addition, we also have, uh, we're working on the design of the downtown intermodal center. Uh, the Clearwater Beach Transfer Facility will be completed in time for spring break. We've got various technology improvements, and on our regional fair, uh, media project, the Flamingo, we will have a full robust app that will be rolled out next year. 
So how does this look when we take all this and put it together when we look forward? So when we look forward in a five-year plan, we are balanced and financially sustainable all the way through 2021. This is way better than what we even had predicted last year. And uh, so two of, I would say, are my biggest challenges is that homestead exemption that will be coming up, $2 million loss each year, and of course, future health insurance costs. So we've listed out some of the things that we're doing here that we've mentioned, um, including on the very bottom, wellness initiatives. And I'm hungry right now because I'm trying to weigh in less. So <laughs> we did that this year. We're going to be having our weigh-in starting, uh, and we're incentivizing our employees to be healthy. So are there any questions related to the budget? Great work. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Quietest meeting you guys have ever had. Oh. <laughs> 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 That is, that is great information. I don't know if this question is appropriate here or maybe to talk offline, but I know we have um, uh, those who are uh, vapid transit haters talking about privatizing transit. And uh, I always say that privatizing says just take this entire income stream, give it to a third party who peels off a piece of profit and then runs the exact same services, possibly with lower uh, salaries and worse benefits for the employees. Um, is that is that a fair and is this the right uh, area to talk about that? Or should we talk about that offline? So, as far as running the whole organization? Yeah, I mean there are folks that are running for for council right now that are advocating privatizing all of these to shut down the doors mm -hmm. and put UNATCO are, on the front on the there front are side. There are agencies that do that. Um, I don't know that a third party would have the vested interest mm -hmm. in thinking, I won't even say outside the box, but let's get rid of the box and think of what we can do. Does I was just curious from a purely important? financial mm -hmm. standpoint, when we talk about privatizing a public transit, is it not the case that we're just taking the exact same revenue streams and the exact same expenses if we're providing the yeah. same services? Well, and um, a case in point of that, you know, PSPA's uh, metrics, when you break these numbers down, to the amount of miles or hours or routes that we serve for this amount of money, we're one of the lowest or cost or most efficient systems in the country. And then, what the um, we just we do contract out some of our routes, Absolutely. like the Jolly Trolley, or like the Looper in downtown St. Petersburg, right, exactly. or like Dart um, is with Care Ride. Mm -hmm. And um, when we got the bids back in for the Jolly Trolley recently, the costs. Uh, from the private companies were not so different than what it would cost PSPA to run it ourselves. I mean, there's really not exactly a load of savings. And you know, yes, you can you can pay um, your drivers a non yeah, less uh, less money, and that's you can save money that way. But then, how do you, you recruit a good driver right. or a safe driver? So. So in the end, basically, we're still talking about the same the same revenue streams and the same expenses, whether we're running it uh, publicly or privately. Yeah. Good. Then I'm not lying whenever I say that to someone. <laughs> and I say it all the time. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So going back to this, uh, um, getting rid of these six operator positions yes. through attrition, and um, is is this overtime going to be mandatory for the operators? It's, no, it wouldn't be, I wouldn't say mandatory, but we have usually our more senior people tend to take it. And uh, we're going to be devising the routes that will require some more overtime to get it done in order to stay on t uh, task, but we do that now in some it, cases. It's not. Um, but not like we're going to. It's not it. mandatory, typically. Um, there are some days where so many people call in sick or um, are out for whatever reason that sometimes they do have a list of people that are uh, not working today because it's not people don't just work here most of the operators don't work Monday through Friday they work lots of them you know the ones that work Saturday get another day off etc so they have a list every day of people that have their off day and then they go through there's a whole union union approved process to calling that list to see if they want to work work these op these open you know routes um, what Debbie's talking about is designing the whole schedule for all of the drivers so that instead of, say, 
their work working 40 hours a week, they, they get routes and, and uh, assignment to work 42 hours in a week. So they're automatically getting two, you know, because you pay overtime after 40 hours. So if you get, if you uh, work 42 hours a week, then you get two hours of time and a half. Um, and then it basically do that times about 380 different drivers. The net result can be that we would save, we would need six fewer drive positions. Um, and then Debbie wouldn't have to pay six people health insurance. That's the key. Uh, but the but uh, people uh, drivers would be working just a few hours, or sometimes even a few minutes uh, more of overtime than they would be now. Um, and they like that. Generally, they 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 like that. And they get to pick their rides, right? Run. Right. I mean, it's a, it, there's a whole picking system based on seniority. They get to bid for the the routes that they want. To, yeah, uh, and if you don't want to work overtime, um, then there'll be some, um, you know, fewer hour options for you to choose from as just, well. Yeah, it just depends on the route and and how many hours in a day that route runs, and then how we split that route into one operator or two operators for a single day, and then we match up all of those days so that people can choose when they want to work and so we piece together the work in the most efficient way possible and so that's what we're, we're talking about doing here i'd just like to make one more comment having um, family members that work for various government um, agencies um, they have no overtime some of the some of them have no overtime list and it doesn't matter if you're on the no overtime list a lot of times you're going to get overtime whether or not you like it and it's and it's really bad for um uh, morale wow. when you're when you're stuck working um, overtime all the time when you're on a list to not do so and that, that was my only comment well that that's why uh, the fear of pricing ourselves out of the market on our health insurance it's too expensive oh, yeah. and so the employee don't get it and then we become a non attractive employer for new for the steady stream of new employees that we need that's what that's what happens. Then, then if we cannot bring in uh, the employees because we can't recruit them, then we then, then you get into that pickle where you are forcing overtime, and then it, it's a downward slope of problems. I've I've been there. Yeah, we we don't have that here at PSA. No, a lot of a lot of the operators ask us for four day work weeks so that they can have a fifth day that they um, can work. They can have open. So we have a, a good list of people who are willing to do that. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Debbie. That was excellent. Um, okay, the, the, last, the next item is the member comments, but I actually wanted to take a look back. I wanted to ask you, Brad, to tell us, you've been riding the bus. Yeah. I, I hate to put you on the spot, but I, I wanted to hear what has been your take of being one of us. <laughs> well, I, I'm tr I've been reading your safety letter, and I'm trying to come up with my own list of things <laughs> uh, to it. I mean, um, so I, I've been uh, not using my car since uh, May 31st. So what's today? Today is June 20, 19th. 20th. 20th. Yeah. So it's been 20 days. Um, I have driven in cars, the PSBA car here, um, but just not my car. And I've been riding the bus a lot, and uh, it's been great. I've, I mean, I've ridden buses my whole life, so I mean, I love it, of course. Uh, but it has really been an eye opener, learning and taking notes and talking to riders and talking to the drivers and seeing interesting ridership things that go on that I had no idea happen. Um, some of the safety things like are that are in the letter. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a real, it's been a real eye-opening experience, but not one that I would say, I don't want to give the impression like it's been bad. It's been perfectly fine. And I'm hoping maybe I might keep doing it past the month of uh, June. Maybe not as religiously or every single day, but Lots of days I think I can do it, and then and the riders that I've met on the bus they they like it. Um, do they know who you are? Some have said they know who I am. Do the drivers, um, the drivers know? 
most of the drivers know. <laughs> like the very first day I got on the bus on June 1st, uh, I said, hi, um, I'm going to try to ride the bus this whole month. And the driver said to me, oh yeah, I got the memo. <laughs> I don't think there was a memo. Uh, but they all know. Uh, the word is out on that. Um, so maybe I'm not having a normal experience. Um, but just like the letter says, I mean, what I think is so amazing is once I get on the bus, once the bus is there and I'm riding, it is no problem. It is peace and happiness. And at least in the morning, nobody nobody talks. They, everyone is on, is doing their own thing. Um, but getting to and from the bus and worrying about the rain and the sidewalk and whether you're going to get hit by a car and all the things around the bus are the are the scary parts. That's so, that's so great to hear. Uh, it's like wow. Yeah, I mean it's the, it's not the bus; it's the um, stuff around and then. And you really just have to, you all know this, you ride. You have to um, organize your activities around the bus lines. But, you know, um, you can't necessarily go far off places like Safety Harbor. Uh, <laughs> on a moment's notice. Exotic safety um, harbor. Yeah. Um, it takes so long to get there, I found. Um, but if you can just organize, like you know, where you go shopping or what, what you do around your line, then it's it's all good. It's good. Great, thank you. And, yeah. And, and what part of county do you live in? I live in St. Petersburg. Okay. And I, I and I I feel like I'm kind of cheating a little bit because I live on the most awesome route. We're at Route Four, which right. runs every 15 minutes. So. Right. Um, and it comes right here to PSTA. So, mm -hmm. um, but I have taken like the 59. I've taken. I think I've calculated. I've taken about eight different routes. Um, I went and met my new board member, who is represents the beaches. He lives in North Reddington Beach. So I rode very early in the morning the Central Avenue trolley and then the Suncoast Beach trolley. I mean, uh, yeah, up to North Reddington Beach. And then Debbie picked me up. Uh, uh, from there uh, to get over here to PSDA because I didn't figure out that. But um. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, then the last item is in member comments. Do, do any of the members have any other comments they wanted to make? I have a question for Brett. Did anybody from Grand Central come to the Grand Central meeting, the Grand Central District Business Association? come to the meeting at the Grand Central Terminal and talk about bus shelters that you remember. Well, um, former PSBA chair and city councilman Jeff Danner. Yes, that's who I was thinking. Yeah, okay. He came to the Riders Town Hall and uh, I think there was maybe somebody else there too. Okay. Um, but I can't remember their name, but okay. yes. Just because like, we were like talking one day at like, dinner or something and it was brought up and I was like, oh, okay. So I was either going to bring it up here, but then he said he was going to go and see you. Yeah, and then I met with him and the uh, uh, chairman I, or president or whatever mm -hmm. of the Grand Central Business District today. Oh, okay. Uh, and talked to them a little bit about it. Okay. Yeah, and they were concerned about signs and bus shelters and things like that in Grand Central. Right. As, as, as many of you may know, um, there's certain parts of Pinellas County that have bus shelters that are funded because they have advertising in them. Um, they, they, they'll place an ad in the one side of the shelter that will pay for the, and there's a company that PSDA um, has a contract with, and they put up the shelter, they maintain it, they pay for it, and each shelter costs about $15,000 a piece at minimum. Uh, and, and they provide that, but they, they get their revenue from the advertising. The city of St. Petersburg has uh, a long history of not, not allowing any advertising shelters. Other cities in Pinellas County do allow them, and there's, there's more than 700 of these over in Hillsborough County, because they're allowed over there. St. Petersburg, no advertising shelters. And there's a proposal from a company to put 23 of them in St. Petersburg that's getting controversial uh, in St. Pete um, with the city council. And I guess this former uh, 
city councilman and chair of PSPA, Jeff Danner, he is, he's not a fan um, of it, and he is opposed to it. And I think, I think the majority of the council are, I'm not sure if it's ever even going to come up to a vote or not. I'm kind of doubtful it'll happen, but we'll see. I know that uh, at the Kona meeting on Wednesday, there's going to be a speaker on this issue, and I guess some of the Kona is up in arms about this. Yeah, yeah. I have a friend on Kona, so it may have been the same person you encountered at Grand Central. His name is Bill. So, um, but yeah, he's on Kona, so he'll probably bring it up. Yeah. But it's on the agenda, so. Um, I will say on my riding on the bus one day, um, I was riding very pleasantly along on my way home, and it was, you know, it's like, it's Florida, too. That's new for me. So uh, it's perfectly sunny and nice here, and where I got on the bus, and I'm totally dry and very comfortable, <laughs> and then it starts completely pouring. Yeah. It's a complete downpour, and I was thinking, well, should I just ride? For the next two hours until it's <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine. I don't have to get out. Um, yeah, nothing doing. And then, but I got out and I just got completely drenched uh, and soaked. So now I have a little umbrella. Um, and um, so then I was thinking about the shelter thing. Mm -hmm. and I was like, well, it would have been nice to have a shelter. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the new shelters that they built, especially on the beach really aren't much of a shelter like the old shelters were I mean like they go like this if it's raining they do nothing they don't barely shelter you from the sun yeah. the newer ones there's one right before John's pass that's really new it's it's really cute I mean, it's really nice it's a to beach look ball, at beach, uh, it's a umbrella. cute little yeah cute little metal bench colorful with a little pretty that doesn't even get shit. <laughs> it's really cute to look at. Yeah. But if it was raining or if you want to get out of the sun, it is not a show. <laughs> we'll let the city do it. And a lot of those new metal ones, it's like you can't sit on them. They're so hot. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are. They probably, why they did metal, I have no idea on a lot of them. I mean, maintenance, I'm sure, but not good in the winter or the summer. <laughs> Gloria, yes. I have one question. What's the number one reason that ridership is down? Because I know that was mentioned in the presentation by Debbie. I'm just curious. Sarah, there's been, I wouldn't know? say uh, there's one number one reason, or okay. at least not that we right. have analyzed. Right. Uh, there's a number of factors. Uh, ridership is down nationwide. Okay. And actually, even continent-wide, because oh, I know wow. ridership was down in Canada, too. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> Uh, and ours is very consistent with the national trend, and most studies are showing that it's a combination of gas prices being at a historic low for a relatively long time, the economy um, improving, uh, uh, because we're we're down, but we're um, we're down from our record high uh, that we've ever had, and we're still up on a long-term trend, fairly high. Um, and then um, Uber and Lyft right. options okay. are certainly, I think, having yeah. an effect. Yeah. Um, and will probably have a greater effect in the future. Okay. Yeah. Any other member comments, questions? Okay. We're having a meeting after this meeting. We are. For those of you who are interested in uh, the, uh, the meeting about, uh, this one will be on? Regionalism. Hmm? On, yeah, regionalism, on our initiatives. Um, and so, uh, that will that will be following this meeting. So, uh, any other comments for this meeting? Then the meeting is adjourned to our next meeting, which will be on July 18th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, aren't we? Well, we're we allowed to start. We have a five-minute break. Yeah, five-minute break. We have a five-minute break. Five-minute break before we start on the uh, on the initiative meeting. And I'm going to try the initiative meeting. I'm going to try to have us be done by like six fifty.